Oh my god. This is why I hate Endgame. This moment right here. It's not the A-Force, it's the Cringe Force. Ugh, no thanks, no thank you. I tell you what, this is the Russo brothers pandering to Kevin Feige's ideology that the MCU going forward is going to be more focused on female-led superhero films. Forget the blokes, forget equality, it's just about the girls. Now, if you're an avid film goer like I am, you'll know that fan service has different interpretations. For me, it was always the case of when will Robert De Niro do a film with Al Pacino in the same scene? Well, Michael Mann, one of the goats, he answered this question in 1995 in Heat. If you haven't seen this film, don't talk to me. Now, you know, if you've seen this famous scene now where the, our two protagonists, well, really an antagonist and a protagonist, are sat at a dining table, you know why this scene is absolutely super special. Face to face. If I'm there and I gotta put you away, I won't like it. But I'll tell you. If it's between you. If it's between you. And, and some, some poor bastard, bastard whose, whose wife, wife you're gonna turn into a widow. Brother, you are going down. God damn, man. That's what I'm talking about. Now, the reason why I use this particular scene when I talk about fan service, because Spider-Man No Way Home, for me right now, is the gold standard of how you do fan service, and more importantly, how you do it correctly. <laughs> You serious? A Spider-Man, a Spider-Man Does whatever a spider can A spins a wave in his eyes So it's been a few days since I saw Spider-Man No Way Home And just as a warning folks, as a caveat as I like to call it. This is not a review, this is a spoilerific impressions video. So rather than giving you a recital of what happened in this scene and what happened in that scene, I'm just gonna give you my thoughts, what I thought didn't work, what I thought worked extremely well, and then just ran it all off that way. So let's start off with what didn't work for this movie. Doctor Strange, Benedict Cumberbatch. He was good, not bad at all, but he's meant to be the Sorcerer Supreme. He did not show any supremacy in this movie at all. Uh, but one thing I did like though, he actually called out an Easter egg, which I laughed hard at and nobody else in the audience got it because the apartment building that he stays in, he says was used in an episode of the 1980s TV series, The Equalizer. And yes, when I saw that, I had a little bit of deja vu. And then suddenly when he confirmed that, I thought that is just awesome. I love that. Now, Jamie Foxx as Electro, I will talk about the villains briefly when I get into this this uh, re uh, reactionary video. He, um, yeah, he meets uh, Andrew Garfield at the end. Yes, Andrew Garfield, Tom McGuire are in this movie, but you already knew that. So when he sees Garfield without the mask, he drops a not so subtle hint about wishing that this version of Spider-Man was a black kid. Who is he talking about, I wonder? So when I heard that moment and I saw it, I just thought, I kind of looked at my friend and I kind of rolled my eyes. I mean, he was delighted. I was just like, well, they had to do that, didn't they? And of course you had a couple of uh, hand claps in the audience. I'm like, no, no, hold your horses, folks. It's not going to be that easy. If Miles Morales was such a big deal, they would have already have shown him walking through a portal or maybe the end credit scenes, he might meet Peter at his dorm, which could happen actually in the next film, but I'll get to that in a while. So the thing on Miles Morales, okay, when you say Miles Morales, you've got to say Miles Morales is Spider-Man. You just can't think of him as Spider-Man. Peter Parker, he is my Spider-Man. The minute you say Peter Parker, you know who he is. Now, there is an exception to this rule that in the spectacular Spider-Man comics, you have Peter Parker's name emblazoned above that title, but then they soon dropped it. I'm not sure what the reason is for that, but um, that's the only time that I know where they had to reassure the audience that it is Peter Parker. So the one thing that if Miles Morales does become a reality in the Sony Spider-Verse, 
You can bet your bottom dollar that character will become heavily politicized. Not by Sony as much, although they could, I wouldn't put it past them, but by the community that he's aiming to please. I mean, will it be a, a Latin X Spider-Man? Who knows? It could be. With a bad take this week from Steven Spielberg, it would not surprise me at all. Now, have I played the Miles Morales video game on PlayStation? No, I haven't. Will I? Not sure, because again, that game was politicized as well because they refused to use the NYPD as part of some of the game's action scenes. They've actually switched the scene to uh, the letters around, so it's like PDYNY or something like that. It's really, really ridiculous. And to me, when I heard that, I thought, do, does Insomniac Games know that the NYPD is a very integral part of the Spider-Man lore? Like you go back to the early comics in the 60s, you know, whenever Peter Parker, AKA Spider-Man is stopping crime in the streets, who's who's there on the scene? It's the NYPD. It's this uneven relationship they've had over the years. Sometimes the police turn on him because they think he's a vigilante. Other times they're really, really grateful for his help. So I can't, I don't know what, it's just so bizarre. I don't understand, it's, oh man. But you know what? All the talk is about, oh, Miles Morales this, Miles Morales that. What about Ben Riley? This is a character who kick-started his career in 1975. Miles Warren, aka the Jackal, created Ben Riley, a clone Spider-Man. And that guy has got a lot of history. Why don't they make a live action version of that dude? And yes, when you say Spider-Man, you don't think of Ben Riley. It is just, you've got to say Ben Riley Spider-Man. And he's a very, of course, he became the Scarlet Spider in the 90s. So if anything, Marvel can dip into that Spider-Verse and pull him out of that bag of tricks and give us a couple of films with him. I think he will be just as compelling as Miles Morales. But on to the really good stuff now, guys. So this film is the gold standard for fan service without being cringy. Now, when we see the emergence of the supervillains, obviously, this is kickstarted with Alfred Molina, then you got Willem Dafoe, then you have Thomas Hayden Church as Sandman, he's really good, Reese Ilfans as Kurt Connors, the Lizard, and of course, Jamie Foxx as Electro. This, is that a quartet? No, it's a sextet, no, that's, a, that's six. I forgot what it is, what the collective term for five villains is, but anyway, you have these five villains, it's really great. And what I do love is that when Aunt May sees them or meets them for the first time, she's got this real compassion about them. But first of all, it's like, who are these people? But then of course, one of the people that she meets, one of the villains that she meets is Willem Dafoe as Norman Osborn. And I thought this is a very good depiction of mental illness because you know, he was a guy who started off rich and now he's he finds himself in a different dimension and he's homeless, he's destitute. Re I found that really great. And Willem Dafoe, man, this guy was the MVP villain of this piece. He was absolutely fantastic. I mean, again, he effortlessly switches between a quite a sane guy to a really insane killer machine. It's nuts. Alfred Molina was good, but what I liked about this particular thing with the villains, I wasn't sure how they were going to handle them, but the way they did it was really, really clever like using magic as a as a resource as to why they're in this dimension and then eventually end up in Happy Hogan's Tony Stark hideout and I love that moment because it's like all these iconic actors playing these iconic Spider-Man villains together in one room and they just get on with each, with each other. It's so fantastic. Of course, the reason why we have them there is because Peter wants to send them back to their original dimensions, but as good versions of themselves, not the murderous beings they became afterwards. Because some people have said that this is kind of like a, an, an, uh, a Christianity angle on things. Like, you know, for Christianity, you've got to learn to forgive your enemies. I'm not religious, so I don't really buy that for me it's kind of more of a moral code of ethics if you feel like you want to help somebody then this is how you do it now if you want to get religious on yo ass spider-man 2 from 2004 where peter parker saves those passengers from that runaway train and as they pull him overhead you can see that christ-like imagery like he's almost on the cross that is fantastic charlie cox as matt murdoch aka daredevil we see him for five minutes and five minutes only when a white key when that white cane slaps on the ground and i've got this right in my prediction video remember when i said that you see a sign saying devil in disguise i said you're going to see matt murdoch in it and i was correct so yeah when he 
slams that white cane on the floor and he sat around at this table with May Parker, Happy Hogan, and of course, Peter Parker. There's a moment where a brick comes flying through the window and Matt is just there like, yeah. I'm a good lawyer. I'm like, yeah, that's it. So you know what? Watch the Netflix series or Daredevil written by Drew Goddard. Just cringe and wait until Marvel revitalized that character with probably power director couples such as Bert and Bertie. What a great job they've done with Hawkeye so far. Now, when it came to the actual big reveals, Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield, I would say that I gave those guys equal cheers. They were fantastic. Now, this may come as a shock to you. And of course, the thumbnail of this video probably gave it away. But Andrew Garfield, he is a redemption arc of this movie. He's fantastic. <laughs> He reminds you why he is a great actor. The dude is gonna get Oscar nominated for Tick, Tick, Boom. The story about the guy who founded the Rent musical. And he's a t he's just so good in this. Gone is the very cool, overconfident Spidey. And yes, I've got the steel box because what this film made me appreciate, I can go back to those amazing Spider-Man films now, and, and they're like, despite the fact they're not perfect, there are some great things about them, and I do like Garfield as the amazing Spider-Man. He is just so good. But here, man, his interaction with Tom Holland and Tobey Maguire, it is so awesome. Like, they're almost like three gossipy ladies, but they're really cool guys in cool Spider-Man outfits. Like, and, and when they find out that Maguire's got uh, organic webs, that is just hilarious. They, they could have gone down the line of cringe, but they don't. You see Andrew Garfield in a lab coat with a suit underneath, which I thought was well done, man. That is awesome. But um, of course, Without the Spider-Verse, I mentioned Miles Morales before, we wouldn't have had that awesome uh, finger pointing moment at the end. And when they do it here, it is so unexpected because I wondered if they were actually going to address that, but they did. So forget Alex Kurtz, the man who ruined uh, Amazing Spider-Man 2. This could mean, I mean, it's just a speculative thing on me. If they make the Am Amazing Spider-Man 3, bring back Andrew Garfield, but get John Watts to direct it. That's what I need. Nothing more, nothing less. And Aunt May dies. I have predicted this earlier on. I said it would be her and Happy Hogan, but Hogan gets to live another day. But when Aunt May dies, it's some of the best acting I've seen from Tom Holland, especially. And of course, Marissa Tomei as May, she gets to utter those great lines that was uttered by Cliff Robertson, with great power comes great responsibility and so forth. So I enjoyed that moment. But this film is a certified 100% crowd pleasing movie. It really is. You'll go in there, you'll probably have a few niggles like I did, like I brought up here today in today's video about what they could have, because you know what? Hollywood doesn't know when to shut up. You have a great moment and then they ruin it with a couple of lines of cringe dialogue and you're thinking, why do they go there? Of course, the post credit scenes, you see Tom Hardy as Venom, kind of still doing that really funny American accent, but I kind of liked what they did with that character. Still not convinced about his insertion into the MCU. And then you had this trailer for Doctor Strange 2 into the multiverse of madness. I think what's gonna happen is, is that all the other major or not so major female characters like America Chavez will push him out of the way and it becomes their movie. So yeah, I don't really, I'm not really looking forward to that. I don't think this film addressed the consequences of what the uh, multiverse will look like within the MCU. If anything, this movie is an outlier. It feels very much like its own film, even though it's supposed to be part of the MCU going forward. And um, the one conclusion that we didn't get is, when all the uh, villains are sent back to their original dimensions, what happened to them? We don't actually find this out. So is it gonna be a deleted scene? Is it gonna be an extended cut somewhere? I don't know, it's just so, that I think that was left out on purpose. Maybe we're gonna see, maybe they come back in a future film. I hope not. I think this film kind of caught everything. It just caught like lightning in a bottle. And I don't know if we'll be able to recapture it going forward. The last thing I will say is the very last thing that we see of Peter Parker 
is that he's got the classic John Romita spider suit on. He's poor again, he's living in a rundown apartment, and he's swinging in the snow. It is just a magical moment. But I've got to say, the one thing that got me teary-eyed in the end was just seeing my spider boys, my spider men, on the screen together. Andrew Garfield, Tobey Maguire, and Tom Holland. Those are my spider guys. They'll always be my spider guys from now until I end up buried six feet under. So folks, if you have seen Spider-Man No Way Home already, what did you think about it? Do you agree with my thoughts? Do you disagree? If so, please give a webtastic comment below in that box or slap that subscribe button right in the face because you know what? It deserves it. And better yet, you might want to like this video. Tell YouTube you appreciated this. Tell YouTube that you're gonna share me across all platforms. Maybe even TikTok, which I don't go anywhere near. So on that one, folks, look after yourselves and I'll see you on my next video rant, maybe outburst, who knows? Coming with me.